I call it uh, grace and boundaries. There's two types of boundaries. One is rigid and one is flexible. The majority of your boundaries are going to be flexible and then some are going to be rigid. And that's that adaptation that you're talking about where maybe these two goals are not aligning correctly because one goal is more priority than the other. But right now you want to focus on this other goal. You have to. Like, for instance, when I decided I wanted to do three 200 mile races in a year, my priority was that. I had to sacrifice other priorities and goals because that was more important to me. Some things you have hard lines for, but then other things, it's like you shift based on your focus for the season. One thing that I, I have found that's been helpful for me is implementing anchors in my life that are going to keep me on track, whether it's anchor events, whether it's like accountability from other people. Without those things, I could easily catch myself drifting and, and go weeks or months without being who I know God's called me to be. And uh, it just takes a little bit to drift off that path. And then there's the other type of naysayer that's going to say, Pierce, like, bro, you haven't lived life yet. You're 23 years old. You haven't had a kid. You haven't faced major death or loss. You haven't faced these tragedies that we all fear as human beings that age inevitably gives us. So why do you deserve to talk about resiliency? I've never talked about this on a podcast before, but you can, you can sense the frustration. The Patina Podcast is about the earned wisdom found in pain. It's about chasing failure, catching it, using that as an opportunity. It's about scar tissue and sinew. It's about stretch marks and dented fenders and refusing to hide them. It's about pushing our insecurities and shame to the forefront instead of behind us. Instead of seeing rust as something that compromises a structure's integrity, we choose to see it as the grit that builds character. This is the Patina Podcast. All right, all right. So today on the Patina Podcast, we have Pierce Shao. And for a long time, I was calling you Pierce Show. So now I know you're real. Uh, the pronunciation of your last name is Shao. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised you got it right, man. Yeah. So, well, I've done my research on you, dude. So, yeah, Pierce is a 23-year-old, young, up-and-coming rising star within the ultra running community scene. Last year, he completed the triple crown of the 200s. Uh, he was also, I believe, the youngest male to ever do so within the, com yeah. the completion of the 200s. So that's awesome. He's a young man, but this dude has so much wisdom that I want to try to tap into within this episode. And what I want to do is just get right into the meat of all this. And, mm. um, and so, yeah, is that okay with you? A hundred percent, man. Well, well, first I'll just say I'm honored to be here, Kenny. Uh, thank you for inviting me on the show to be here. I, I really appreciate it. I also really appreciate too, that you did, did your research that you, uh, you learned about me so that you can ask the best questions to, to provide the most value to the audience. And then, uh, I live in Dallas, Texas now, but I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I was, uh, my earliest memories were basically my parents getting divorced when I was six years old. And so that, that was really difficult and challenging on me. But one thing I realized when I was 16 years old was there are so many benefits from it. And I think there are two camps that we can live in as people. We has my balloons go off in the background. <laughs> we, we can live as the victim of our circumstances, or we can see it, as God using every single thing for our good. There's this verse in the Bible that says in Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. So if you love God and you are been called according to his purpose, which I am, I a hundred percent believe, you know, you can be, anyone can be, if they decide to follow God, that means God's going to literally use everything together for your good. And so essentially I, I grew up with divorced parents, but some of the things that that shaped me now, I, I didn't realize this at the time because at the time I was envious. I wish my parents were together. I wish I had a mm -hmm. quote unquote, like whole family, but I later realized that this made me more independent 
It made me more responsible. It made me more resilient. And it gave me a drive growing up uh, to be the best that I could be that I think not everyone has from a young age. And so growing up, I had this drive and it wasn't really until high school that it channeled down the direction of running. I, I played sports. I started lacrosse when I was in, uh, in, in third grade. I, I did well in school and stuff, but a real defining moment happened in high school during lacrosse tryouts. And so when I was a freshman in high school, there's this uh, week at the beginning of tryouts called Hell Week. And everyone was like, it, it's like they, they consider it the worst thing ever. Like we always mm -hmm. dreaded it every single year because it was just a ton of conditioning, a ton of running. And every practice the first week started out with a 5K. And when you're in high school, what, what would that be? Going into freshman year, maybe 14 years old or so, mm. 15. Man, a 5K, it, it, it sounds like awful. And maybe you're listening to this and you're like, a 5K sounds horrible. Uh, and, and I thought that at one time too. Mm. I thought like, man, how am I even going to do this 5K? Can't I even run three miles straight? And so uh, we go out to do this 5K for, for tryouts. And one thing I realized was I was actually one of the better runners on the team. I was actually able to keep up with some of the seniors and be one of the top 10 or so people to finish out of probably 50 or so people trying out. Mm. And, and this gave me confidence because it's like everyone, we're drawn towards naturally what we're, we're good at, right? And we want to go down that path deeper. And so... By the time sophomore and junior year came around, I was finishing the 5K before everyone else. And uh, and it was this thing that I was just going super hard at, whether that was because I was the best runner on the team or also because uh, people to start off tryouts weren't trying to burn themselves on the 5K. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but I don't care because it, it gave me that confidence to then yeah. once my senior year came around, I decided to do a half marathon. And it's in September of 2018. So I was met with doubt. And, and I think it's, you know, it, listening to this, you can probably relate to a time where you've set a big goal and you've been met with doubt. Whether it's someone asking you, are you really sure you can do that? Whether it's someone asking you, for me, how are you going to fuel for that? H how long have you ever run before? Have you ever run a half marathon before? Like, how do you hydrate? So all these questions that I had no clue of, but I was just like, I'm just going to go for it. And part of the reason that I, I just went for it is because growing up every single year, my mom would run a marathon. She wouldn't make a big deal about it, but it was just kind of her thing. And so for the last 32 years, she's run a marathon every mm -hmm. single year. And she never told me to run. She never even suggested I run. But what she did is she set a good example. And there's so much power in just being an example. And, and she didn't tell me, she didn't force me, but by her example, I thought I could do it. I was like, if, mm -hmm. she, could, if she could do a marathon, surely I could do a half marathon. And so I set out to do this half marathon. I met with a lot of gal. I go to it. It was very challenging, but I ended up doing it. And about couple minutes later, I am like, oh my gosh, I'm reflecting on it. I'm like, I just did this. I wasn't sure that I could do it before. What else is possible? Like, what mm -hmm. else can I do? And so it unlocked this belief in myself of like, what else out there is something that I didn't think I could do before, but now I can do. Yeah, that, that question that once that's un unlocked, when you unlock that idea of what else am I capable of, like you're kind of in this, in the space of what you expect you're capable of. And then when you ask yourself that question thoroughly, like curious now, because you've just done something that you thought was impossible or you thought was like, there's no way I could do it. All of a sudden, like that question just kind of floats out into the abyss because it's like, there's no longer boundaries around the question of what you think you're capable of. It can have this 
appealing, fun, exciting, frightening feel to it because you're like, what else can I push myself to now? Because now, now I might just get crazy. I don't know. And then also yeah. Pierce, like, like I said, I've done my research and I know your mom uh, runs marathons and she, so she's does endurance stuff and me being a father, what was that like for you? Maybe your siblings, if you have siblings to kind of see that model in front of them, to see something like running a marathon as this is a normal behavior I do once a year. You know, one thing was like, she would, she would always do it, but like my mom was a nanny. So she was working really hard. She was going to work from like, 7 8 a.m to like 5 6 p.m so like she'd run before we even awake so a lot of times i didn't even know but in in she ran long before i realized like so it was really around the time of middle school high school when i started to respect it because i under i started to understand what what it really took like i i hadn't done one so i couldn't fully understand but because I had run a mile, two miles, I had started to like respect her for it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a lesson in that just because your kids aren't seeing the fruit of what you're doing and, and aren't inspired by it doesn't mean you should stop. Mm-hmm. Like you, you got to be an example regardless of what their response is, because eventually they're going to be like, oh, wow. And it may be even when they're 20, 25, 30, it may not, it may take until then that they realize when they go out into their, their own world, into the world, they realize, oh man. But I think that, I I think that was probably the biggest thing that I remember from her setting that example is like, it made it more possible for me and also That was the trigger to then unlock the belief of what else is possible, which Mm -hmm. has been one of the best beliefs that I've had in my life. Like other, other than like my belief in God, of course, but like this thought process of what else is possible and not being confined by what other people project onto me of what they think is possible has been. Yeah so powerful and unlock so many doors so many opportunities so many relationships like like if i if i would have listened to everybody else i would be in college or i would have graduated now uh, but i'd be an accountant making however much accountants let's, make but miserable yeah. so, so let's let, let's talk about that for a second pierce because that was yeah. one of my questions you're like going straight into my questions for you but like so one of the things you had, you were mentioning earlier was like the doubter that is like they doubt themselves because they're thinking, you know, wow, you know, this guy Pierce is doing all these incredible endurance feats, feats or whatever. But then there's also the in doubt, the doubter, you might say hater or naysayer that would say, you know, first, like they're projecting their own fears of themselves onto you and saying what you're doing is crazy and you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to destroy your knees. You're going to yeah. do all these sorts of bad things for yourself. So that's one type of naysayer. And then there's the other type of naysayer that's going to say, Pierce, like, bro, you haven't lived life yet. You're 23 years old. You haven't had a kid. You haven't faced major uh, death or loss. You haven't faced like these these tragedies that we all fear as human beings that age inevitably gives us. So, like, why do you deserve to talk about resiliency? You know, that mm. sort of thing. So what, what about that side of the naysayer as well? I just wanted to take a quick pause and genuinely thank you for getting this far through the episode. This podcast is very small if you haven't noticed. So every like, every comment, every follow or subscribe, it really makes a difference. So my only request from you is to interact with the content if you like it. Like and follow, rate and review, and share if you feel like this is something that's worthy of sharing. Thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Well, I would say, well, first off, I'd say, I, like, you don't have to listen to me. Like, <laughs> like don't, don't listen to me. Like, if, you, if you're going to doubt that I have wisdom, don't listen. Because, uh, I, like, I don't care. Like, I, I would hope that you could learn something from what I've gone through. But 
to 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 in it in another direction i would challenge you to define what qualifies someone to be able to give me advice and one of the best best indicators of whether i listen to someone on something is are they where i want to be are mm. they where i want to be because i'm not going to listen to someone who has never run a marathon about running i'm never going to listen to someone who is 100 pounds overweight about how to get fit or how i should eat or how i should exercise i'm not going to listen to someone who is criticizing me saying i'm going to blow out my knees when they don't run at all <laughs> right and so mm. For me, like what I feel like, you know, qualifies me to be able to impact people's lives and speak into people's lives as well. Went through through a lot of different things, like dropping out of college, like that is tough and challenging, figuring it out. And and the, the funny thing is, when when we think of someone who drops out of college, we think of them as like, oh, you're just a dropout. Like I, I was a 4.0 student. I went to USC. I was studying accounting. I was like a, a really top student. So the challenge for me was not school. The challenge for me was doing something that I knew was not going to lead me down the path that I wanted to go on. Mm. And dealing with the societal pressure of how people view you after you leave college when you know you're, you're like, and and believe me, hear hear my heart in this. This is not like I I don't have a big ego or whatever. But like hearing how people judge you because you left college, despite you knowing that you're so much like smarter than them. Mm. Like, and it's not because school was hard that you dropped out. And I, I've never talked about this on a yeah. podcast before, but but hear my heart on that. I'm, I'm not saying I'm better than people, but you can you can sense the frustration. Yeah. But then, too, the last thing, why should someone listen to me on resiliency? Well, how much resiliency do you think it takes to run a half marathon, run a full marathon, do a half Ironman, do a full Ironman, run 100 miles through the Florida Keys in 80 to 90 degree weather with 100% humidity, run 100 miles through Leadville, Colorado, uh, reaching 13,000 feet where in, in the in the SEAL teams, one of my friends is a Navy SEAL. Above 13,000 feet, the FAA requires them to wear an oxygen mask because of the oxygen tank uh, content is so low. Yet we were running up there mm -hmm. at 15,000 feet of elevation gain and descent over the course of that race. Another 100 miler in that year. Ultraman Arizona, which is a 6.2 mile swim, 90 mile bike ride the first day. 171 mile bike ride the second day 52.4 mile run the third day and then three 200 mile races in three months one uh, the second one being just 17 days after the first one yeah. so it was 221 214 and 250 is what my watch clock but yeah if you don't want to listen to me and talk about <laughs> resiliency what that that takes like don't listen so, can I add, can I yeah. add something to, yeah, yeah. I think that age does not equivalent experience. Experience mm -hmm. is how much you do in a lot of times people who are older have more experience because they've had more years to do things. But if you find someone who is younger, but has jam packed a ton of things into those years, they have a lot of experience. So like for me, I have the experience of all of these ultra marathons. I basically have probably 10 to 20 years experience of ultra marathons in my five years of running because every year, I've done three to four major endurance challenges. So think about this. This is a clear example. So a lot of people will do one 200-mile race in a year. So to get three 200s, that would take three years of experience. 
But for me, I did three in three months. So I took three years of experience and packed it in to three months. And so that's how I have a lot more experience. And, and I'm not saying I know everything. There's so much that I need to learn. But that was just a perspective that I wanted to give. Yeah, I, I think that's great insight. I think I, I was told something years ago that you can learn something every day from a three-year-old if you're open to it. And once my oldest turned three, I knew that was true. And then also my very first episode was with my oldest at the time he was nine, my very first episode. And the point was that you can learn something from somebody that is much younger than you, despite the fact that they may not have experience of years on their side, they have they can still have great wisdom on something. And my child has been raised with me, somebody who is fascinated with resilience. So he happens to have great insight on resilience, far better than his peers, far better than clients that I work with that are adults or in their fifties. And, and so it's that experience can be shared to even through the mouths of babes. Right. But you know, that's going to be the critique that anybody who's young, who's talking about experience or wisdom is going to get. And I just think it's ridiculous because like you said, yeah, if you, you know, like as a parent, that's what you want as a parent. You don't want your child to be like, Hey, I hope they have a crack addiction and then overcome that someday so that they can have great experience in that. That's not what you're looking for. You're wanting yeah. for them to, to take on challenges early in life, learn what failure feels like and continue to chase it despite the fact that it feels bad. And then, and then continue to grow and evolve as people experientially and, and hope that they have less trauma as possible. Right. I imagine your parents are very proud because this is what you're doing. Um, you're putting in intentional suffering so that you don't have to deal with unnecessary suffering. You're intentionally yeah. doing it and they're, thereby you're fast tracking your path in life. And, and, you know, people who are listening cannot take it from you, but they can take it from me being somebody who has 17 years of sobriety, has been a combat vet, was in Afghanistan from, from 03 to 04 at the early stages of OEF, just years of life doesn't like, it doesn't equate to experience and actually taking on challenges. Cause there are plenty of people, like I said, who are 50 years old, 60 years old, still avoiding and fearful of any challenge whatsoever in their life. Why do you suppose people don't embrace taking on a challenge? We know it's fear, but obviously, but why do you suppose people are unwilling to overcome that fear to take on a challenge? Not just running a mm. hundred miles, not just running even a marathon, but just challenge in general. Mm. I think, I think it can kind of vary. Uh, it can vary like, Person to person, I think for me personally, the biggest reason why, and it's, I'm, I've grown through this a lot, but I think fear of man and fear of what other people think is like mm. a huge specific crippling fear, whether I know it in certain things or not, like I can, I I recently just found found myself fearful on one specific thing uh because of how it would make me look and I think a lot of times for me it's like fear of looking in incompetent even though like it's it's like 90% made up in my head most of the time mm -hmm. like for instance like it's it, like for me it's something specific with like taxes and doing my taxes this year and like writing out off expenses and uh, a couple things and, and one thing with the rental property I own. But like I, I, I've noticed, I'm like, why haven't I not done this? And it's like, oh, well, I'm fearful of what someone may think of me because of me not doing a certain thing or doing a certain thing wrong. So I think 
a lot of times we just, man, we just get in our heads about what other people are going to think about us. And it's complete garbage because everyone's thinking pretty much about what you're thinking of them. So they're not even wasting their time thinking about you. And, and if they are judging you for, for specific things you're doing, like maybe they're not like someone you should, you should value their, their opinions on things. So, yeah, I, I think that fear of uh, what other people may think of you and then like just failure, um, like no one wants to fail. And, and it's funny because the most successful people have failed a lot. And that's something I try and tell myself. I, I was thinking about this actually in the shower before this uh, podcast is if, if there are any books specifically on uh, like failure in, 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 in fear of failure and overcoming that because that's like the gateway to breakthrough and growth mm-hmm. is trying things that you aren't sure you can do, sucking at them, but getting better. Because you're doing the work yeah, and then becoming great at them. Because if you think back to anything you tried for the first time, whether it was you were, you know, you shooting a gun, whether it was you doing the podcast, whether it was me running, whether it was me coaching uh, some of my running clients, whether it was me uh, just praying out loud. The first time you do something, you're not going to be great at it most of the time. If, if you're good at it, awesome. Great for you. But you grow based on experience. And so that's something I have to constantly remind myself of. It's like, it's, it's good that I'm failing because I'm getting these failures out of the way so that I can be successful. Yeah. Yeah. One of the mottos that we have at my practice is chase failure or chasing mm. failure because I want to normalize and it, I want to normalize that failure is going to happen and I want to make it acceptable because you're not going to do anything that you currently see as impossible unless you're willing to endure failure. And so the idea of you're going to fail either way, you can either fail like cowering down in the fetal position on the ground and being kicked in the ribs by it, or you can get up and chase it. And I tell people, if you get up and choose to chase failure, then first of all, you're going to find out failure is far faster than you think it is. If you chase it, Mm. it's actually pretty fast. It's hard to catch if you try to catch it. But when you inevitably do catch it, it's going to be painful. But the pain of that and what you've learned in the experience of the chase itself is going to give you the wins that stacked up over a period of time enough so that you know, you're better at it than you previously were. All the hours of putting in, all the hours over the period of time, you've become so much more resilient and better as a result. So it doesn't even mean necessarily that the goal needs to change. It's just that you keep going after the same goal or maybe the goal needs to change and adapt, right? But yeah, so Mm -hmm. chasing failure is such an important thing. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to add that motto, chase Mm -hmm. failure. I love that. Because that's like, it is the bridge. It is the gateway. And, and, and what if, what would happen if instead of fearing failure, we, we saw fe- failure as feedback and information then, and we completely reframed it. Like, for example, I, I went out for a run Thursday night after a day, a uh, pretty long day of work. And, uh, I, I have two main fitness goals right now. I want to run a sub two, two hour, 54 minute marathon. Mm. And then I want to get a six pack. I, I want to get uh, less than 10% body fat. So those are two goals I'm simultaneously working towards. Well, one thing that I'm doing to lower my body fat percentage is I am uh, doing something called carb cycling where I, one day I'll have 300 grams of carbs. The next day I'll do 150. And then the day after that I'll do 75. Now, one thing with marathon training and doing speed work is that carbs are very important mm-hmm. because you need to fuel properly so that you can run uh, these certain paces or else it's like very, very difficult. And so I went out for this run on Thursday night and I got two, two sets in and I just did not have it. Like I, I just... I was like, man, this is just 
I can't do this. Like, I, I just can't do this workout. And so I ended up, it's supposed to be 10 miles in this specific workout. I ended up doing uh, seven miles. And, and after the first two reps, I, I ended up just running easy the rest of the, the, the workout. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to finish this run. I'm going to carb up and I'm going to go for it tomorrow uh, with the proper fueling. I'm going to forget about like my, my uh, diet plan for, for right now, for today, because out of those two goals, running the sub 254 is more important to me. And so I ended up doing it, ended up going out uh, last night, crushed the workout, did great, hit all my, my sets. And like, I, I, I made adjustments because I failed. I was given information that I, I need these carbs to hit my paces. And so I carved up on Friday, knocked out the workout. Boom. Now I know I have to get carbs in to be able to hit the paces I want. And that came because of failure. And I think that failure is only failure if you don't make an adjustment. So I just wanted to throw out that yeah. like tactical specific example of something that happens for me because I, I still fail a lot. Thanks for that practical advice because that was actually going to be one of the questions I was going to ask you in terms of what tools do you use practically to help with sustaining goals and focus? That's one of the things that, so we're, the language is a little bit different, but I think it's the same premise. So I call it uh, grace and boundaries. So I would say you have, you have boundaries that you established for yourself. There's two types of boundaries. One is rigid and one is flexible. The majority of your boundaries are going to be flexible and then some are going to be rigid. So for like me as a, as an addict, I have a pretty rigid boundary that I'm not going to use mind altering substances, right? It's a very rigid boundary. Mm. And also being married, I have a very rigid boundary that I'm not going to sleep with other women. Have it, right. Like, I, like yeah, there are yeah, some yeah. boundaries that are very rigid and they're inflexible whatsoever, but the majority of boundaries have some flex to them and that flex is grace. And so for those who are just listening, you're not, not going to see the visual here, but from point A to point B, you have a, a bungee cord strapped and sometimes life forces you to push up against that boundary and flex it out. But as long as you have that bungee cord still there, it will kind of push you back onto course. You'll stay on the course. And that's where grace and boundaries comes in. And that's that adaptation mm -hmm. that you're talking about where maybe these two goals are not aligning correctly because one goal is more, more priority than the other, right? Like the, the goal of getting that time is more important to you than the goal of the six pack abs. You can get the six pack abs at another time, or maybe you adapt your plan accordingly. But right now you want to focus on this other goal. And that's a perfect example of grace and boundaries where you're adapting your plan as you go. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you have to like, for instance, when I decided I wanted to do three 200 mile races in a year, my priority was that like, of course I had priorities over that, like my relationship with God. My, my work, like I had to get certain things done for work in, in things like that, certain relationships in my life, but I had to sacrifice other priorities and goals because that was more important to me. So I, I love mm -hmm. that point on grace and boundaries because yeah, th like some things you have hard lines for, it's like, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this. No questions asked, but then other things it's like you, you you shift based on your focus for the season. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. All right. So uh, another thing I wanted to ask you was in, and I've heard it called different things. Post-race blues is probably the most common one I've heard, um, which is probably if I were to look at it from a medical perspective, it's probably very similar to that of postpartum depression and what a lot of women experience after giving birth, which is, an amazing flood of dopamine as a result of achieving a goal and then boom, goal is over. And then there's this sense of within specifically endurance runs, there seems to be for a lot of people, not everybody, but for a lot of people, there seems to be this dip 
within dopamine or this dip within pleasure or this dip within what am I going to do next? And there's a depression that can follow with that. Have you ever experienced any of that? No, a hundred percent. Yeah. So, okay. Like <laughs> almost ev every, every race I do, but I think that it, it comes back to like your focus. I think it comes back to like where you find your value. I think that in your identity as over the course of the last, um, I got saved in 2019. So over the course of the last four years, as I've been following God, my identity has not been in my achievements, but mm. in, in who God says I am. And so that's helpful because if your identity is all caught up in something and then it's over, it's like you're, you have an identity crisis. Like if I, I, God forbid, break my leg tomorrow and I can't run any uh, any more in my life. Yes, I'm going to be bummed because I loved running so much, but my identity isn't in that. So it, it's not going to like derail or destroy me. But, you know, I think also too, it's like, yeah, you have that huge dopamine release from finishing the race. Like for me, I have a bunch of people who reach out to me, emulating me based on the race, sharing how much I inspire them to go push themselves. I've got uh, one, the physical of the dopamine, not only the dopamine, but all that it takes to run a mm. 200 mile race. You're, you're not sleeping, uh, let alone all the miles that you're putting on your feet. Your, your body has no clue what just happened to it. You're just t destroyed. So, so all of that, all the physical things. And then two humans, I believe we all need a goal. We need goals in fitness we need goals in relationships we need goals in our careers we need goals in all areas of our lives because it's you working towards something and and the process of working towards something gives us purpose gives us meaning gives us like feeling like we're on a mission we're on an adventure and uh so so i i'm i'm 99 sure you probably know some psychological things to that but but i know for me I function 10 times better when I'm working towards something. And a lot of times when you finish a race like that, if you don't have a next goal set in mind, it's like, okay, well, what am I working towards? Okay, well, now I'm going to, you know, just slip up on my eating. Oh, it's, it's not that bad if I just have a mm -hmm. dessert here or don't do this workout here or this, this thing here. And, and yes, there's grace for that. Like, you know, if, if you, if you want to celebrate with an ice cream, like go for it. But when you don't have a next defined goal, I find myself drifting and just yes. being led by my feelings. And when you're led by your feelings, your feelings are going to lead you right off a cliff. Like, yes, yeah, I, I have this mentor, Steve Weatherford in my life. He, he says, amateurs make decisions based on their feelings. Pros make decisions based on their commitments. And, uh, and that's 100% true is you got to be led by your commitments and not your feelings. And so that's why, too. For my races, like I'll have one race and I'll already have my next race planned out or the next thing I'm doing so that I can uh, be like, okay, yes, I've got, you know, a week, two weeks where I plan to rest after the race that I've just done, soak it in. Like, man, I'm super grateful for this opportunity, but then I'm on to the next one. Not because I feel like I, I am unfulfilled without it necessarily, but because it's like, man, I want to go. I want to improve. I want to grow. Like we're in a constant state of either we're growing or we're dying. I believe that mm -hmm. through and through, and I want to be growing. Yeah. So let's talk about this concept of Masogi. Mm. I, I became aware of it from reading the book, The Comfort Crisis. Mm -hmm. And and that's how I became aware of it. Though I was practicing something very similar to this so if you're just establishing trying to build up routine or resilience in your life, start with doing something that is intriguing to you, novel to you, sounds fun to you. Start with that. But if you've been doing it over the course of a long period of time, you now need to integrate impossibility. You now need to integrate, I'm going to purposely go and do something that the likelihood of me failing is very high. And so I've been, I've been doing that over the course of, let's say, uh, four or five years. 
And then when I read the comfort crisis, I'm like, oh, well, that's what I've been doing is Masogi. <laughs> so do you want to explain your understanding of Masogi? I know you got a community of folks that are practicing it and doing it together. So you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, 100%. So Masogi, like you can read up on it, but uh, I guess it comes from, it was like a Japanese water purification ritual. But but like the in the context that I understand it now and and use it is, I learned it from a guy named Jesse Itzler, and essentially it's setting up one, a year defining challenge that like you can look back on that year and be like, oh, 2018 was the year I ran my first marathon. 2022 was the year I ran three hundred mile races. So it's like one year defining challenge or task where there's like a 50, 50 chance of whether you finish. So 2023 for me, those, those three. Uh, 200s in an ultraman it doesn't have to be like multiple events it can be starting a podcast starting a business things things like that but one year defining thing that's going to stretch you that's going to grow you and uh and if it's in like one day like a race it's going to be so hard that everything else that year is like easy compared to that one day and so yeah that that's the the Misogi, I, I think there's so much to be learned by doing one. Like when I do these 200 mile races, I learn more in those, uh, over, over those 200 miles than I did sometimes in that whole year, just learning about myself, learning more about like what it takes to, to keep going. I discover new levels of perseverance and grit and, and mental toughness. So yeah, that, that's, uh, what I'm doing. And actually, my hat says it, run your race. I'm starting a, a new company with one of my mentors, Steve Weatherford, where, where we're going to be hosting some some different races and, and things like that, some sogies for people. And so, uh, yeah, there's more to come on that. But, so, but yeah, I awesome. love the concept of Misogi. Yeah, I, I, I like how, too, you're just naturally kind of getting into – a Misogi version of a race director, right? You're just going to start this thing called run your race around it. So that's pretty cool too. That's awesome. Is it something that only the the community locally is going to be a part of, or is it something that you're opening up to, to have other people come in from out of town and be a part of your, your, yeah, run so, your race Misogis? Yeah. So Steve has the, well, for this one, uh, we're doing in December, uh, December 7th and 8th, it's going to be uh, like our communities. And and Steve has this idea of giving out a hundred golden tickets mm. to to certain individuals, and then them uh, being able to invite four people each themselves, because we want to create a, a really powerful community aspect from it to start. Yeah, we're putting on this event on a hundred acres in Austin, Texas, and we're giving it to everyone for free. So wow. so we're not charging for it, but that's kind of like our our first community event um, that we're going to be doing, and it's going to be. We're doing that every year for like our, our core group. And, and it's really going to be a place where families can come together one time per year that otherwise wouldn't see each other because Steve's really big on it. I'm big on it. Like relationships are the most important thing. And how powerful would it be if you know you are seeing, you know, some of your most uh, best friends, favorite families every single year doing something extremely challenging to be able to bring your, your family into that, to be able to bring, yeah, your, your kids and stuff into that. And then two, it's like one, one thing that I, I have found that's been helpful for me is implementing anchors in my life that are going to keep me on track, whether it's anchor events, uh, whether it's like accountability from other people, whether it's like challenges like running or weekly like we do a men's prayer group every Tuesday where uh, about a group of 20, 30 of us get together, we pray, and it's uh, extremely powerful. Those are some that have really helped for me because I, like, without those things, I could easily catch myself drifting and, and go you know, weeks or months without being who I know God's called me to be. And uh, it just takes a little bit to drift off that path. Like I'm sure for you, like with your sobriety journey, like you need those, those anchors, those, those guardrails to help keep you on track. 
um, not because you don't want to stay sober, not because like you, you don't want to do the right thing, but we, we need, we need support and we need to create accountability systems in our lives that are going to help us grow. Yeah. Community is such a huge part of that for, for the sake of accountability, but also just for the sake of human connection of people with like-minded goals, like-minded interests to continue to push each other. You know, there's the accountability part of calling each other out, but also there's the building each other up of here's, here's who you are and here's what you can be, you know? And so that's important. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I purposely didn't want to focus too much on the details of running because there's a ton of content on there out there with you. If people are interested in training, like specific how to train and stuff, you have great insights on that. That's outside the box. Like, because for me, I got in, like I, my first ultra or my first 100 I did in under two years of running in general. Like I, I, I wasn't a runner. And then I went from doing a marathon without training for it to within two years and, and all the wisdom out there on the internet, all the internet wisdom says, you gotta be, you gotta have at least 10 years of running experience before you ever do a hundred. Right. And I know that's not, that's not you either. You, you kind of, you're, you're oh, fast tracking yeah. yourself. In this world and yeah. Not listening to the internet wisdom or the Google wisdom. Like you're just listening to yourself and challenging yourself. And so, yeah. but yeah, I know recently you're, you did the three of seven project run and I, I had, uh, Brooke Wright on uh, a couple of episodes ago. And so, yeah, she was a fantastic guest. So I know you did three of seven. I know you did Leadville, which was your first one. Which is, that's a crazy first like official ultra. I know you did ultras prior to that, but as far as the first u- official one, that's a crazy first one, dude. And then, you know, you did the Ultraman Arizona. You just did the, you just did the, the triple crown of the three hundreds. Pick your favorite child. Pick your favorite child here. Which one? Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I know you're gonna want to not hurt anybody's feelings here and give like, you know, give like all of them are great, but pick a favorite child. Which one was your favorite, and which one, and like, and why? Oh man, it's so hard because I learned something different at each each one. Like for instance, like uh, I actually Leadville was my second official. Oh, my first one was the Keys 100, which is in. I haven't talked about it much. It's probably why you didn't know. Uh, the Keys 100 was in May of 2022. And it was, uh, you know, 90 degrees, 100% humidity mm-hmm. through the Florida Keys. It was my first real 100. I had no, like it was on all pavement. It was flat, but it was all pavement. So that was brutal. I mean, there was, the, there was Leadville and uh, I made mistakes going too fast down the mountains. And so by the end of it, my knee like kind of blew up and, uh, I, I slowed way down towards the end, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, hmm. I think that maybe the, the most like fun was Ultraman Arizona. I don't think it was the hardest, but I really enjoyed like the different disciplines and finishing up within nine to 12, 10, 11 hours every day. And then uh, eating and then going back for some more the next day because it also creates this like cool community of because there are only 20 25 people doing it so you like get mm-hmm. close to them by the end of the 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 event like people are helping out each other uh they really create this like this family feel and, and energy and you have this like end of end of race banquet so it's very like communal i'd say mm-hmm. that was probably my favorite I'd say the hardest was probably the, the triple crown of 200 uh, because, I mean, three 200s. I mean, I I had no clue how I was going to do the second 200 just 17 days after the first. Like, people on my crew uh, were asking me if I was even going to do it because it was so close together. And I'm sure, I'm sure if I would have asked for advice from friends, family, or the internet, it would have been like, oh, there's no way you could do that. But that's a, that's a great example of I asked someone who had done it before. My coach, Mike McKnight, for the 200, amazing coach. He had done it twice before. And so he's like, yeah, yeah, you could do that. And so he's coming on, coming on after Coca Dona. I'm very excited for that conversation. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, he's an amazing, amazing uh, guy, man, and uh, has so much wisdom. So. 
So yeah, like I listened to him for advice. And then and then to like Moab and and having my crew, we we were just you know, we rented a Springer band and they were following me through the mountains the, the three, four days and uh, just all the conversations and things like that was just so fun. But yeah, if if I had to pick, I mean, they're all special for their own reasons, but Ultraman Arizona was probably the most fun. Uh, but then the 200s was the hardest and, and I just have so many memories from that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's you, there's Zach Bates is another young runner that's, really picking up a lot of miles a lot and getting a lot of races under his belt who who's going to be the young runner that's going to chase down ed eddinghausen like who who's going to be the one that takes out the jesters uh records like i i also talked to eric Cohing uh recently and he he says he wants to chase down ed's records who who's going to be the young athlete that's going to come out and take take out the jester who's going to be the one oh dude i don't know that's a great question to be honest for me Man, I, I just like right now things may change, but I don't really have a desire uh, to, to take down his record. I don't have a desire just to do a, a crazy amount of like, oh, like, I, yes, I want to do hundreds and two hundreds and I don't want to stop here. I'm definitely not content. Like I, 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 I got to go sub 25 at Leadville. Like <laughs> I, I went 25, 24 and like you get a bigger buckle when you go sub 25 and the only reason was because I, I blew my knee blew up and I'm not making excuses, believe me. Uh, I, I, that, that sticks with me and I, I want to do it, but yeah, I think, uh, I think it's so important to, to be, to know what excites you and motivates you and pursue that versus trying to just pursue what other people are pursuing or uh, what someone else thinks you should do. Like for instance, for Zach, like he may like want to go after that record so hard uh, and, and, and do it like awesome, more power to you. But I also have a lot of other things going on in my, in my life. Like I don't just run, you know, I, I wanted to do a ton of long stuff. Now what excites me is going fast and, and showing people that you can run 200 mile races and also be fast at the same time. Um, you And then, you know, right after I probably, um, you know, focus even more on, on lowering my body fat percentage because I'm like, well, I, I want to look real good while I do it. So, um, co combine that. So I guess my encouragement, um, based on that question, well, my answer would be, I, it's not going to be me. I, I probably will say, and, and I'm totally fine with that. But then too, my encouragement to people is just to really search yourself and, and ask, you know, what, what do you want? What what motivates you? What inspires you? What sounds really cool to you? And go after that. For me last year or two years ago when I signed up for it was the two, Triple Crown. Like I was like, man, it would be so cool to become the youngest man to do that. And uh, and so I pursued it and I did it. And so, so yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, so more more about just kind of picking up races that mean a lot to you versus racking them up and, and picking up a ton of them. And I think I could relate to that as well. Uh, it's more about just kind of finding events or situations, experiences that would be very meaningful. So yeah, yeah, I totally, I totally can connect with that. I think this, this last question I wanted to ask is I've heard you in, in several podcasts now, and whenever you bring up Christ, and your relationship with Christ, there seems to be an uncomfortability with a guest. And I want to let you know, there's no uncomfortability here with that conversation. So I wanted to actually specifically ask you a question in conjunction to your relationship with Christ. So yeah, how has, you said you were saved in 2019, I believe. Uh, how has your relationship with Christ dictated your relationship with resilience? and taking on challenge. Mm. I think uh, my relationship with God and Jesus has impacted my relationship with resilience because it's given everything I've had to go through meaning. Like what I talked about earlier with Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. So like everything is going to be used by God. And so that, 
that gives me hope and, and faith that every single thing that I have to endure, every single thing that I have to be resilient through is going to have purpose. So it prevents me from, I guess, like getting too down about it or bummed about things. My relationship with God helps me give every single thing purpose. Yeah, thanks for that, man. Yeah, that's uh, that's very important. Well, that's that's it, Pierce, man. Thank you so much for coming on the Patina Podcast, dude. I uh, really appreciate you. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, Kenny. It's been great chatting with you. And uh, anyone listening to this, uh, I hope you took took away something from it. I encourage you to, to write down something that you gathered and something that you're going to actually implement. Because I know I listen to a lot of podcasts and it'd be easy to to listen to one and then just go right on to the next one without changing. But I, I'd encourage you to, to to think about what you heard and, and what stood out to you and, and what changes you need to make. And then too, if you have any questions that I can help with, anyone can can get a hold of me on Instagram. My handle's at Pierce Shao, just my name. And you can uh, get a hold of me there. So thanks so much, Kenny, for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Patina Podcast. There are other shows that emphasize resilience, but my intent is to normalize personal development through embracing challenge by interviewing the common man and woman, the person that you and I can relate to. If you are someone who wants to soak up the insights of normal people doing extraordinary things, please subscribe. If you know somebody who is overwhelmed by fear and complacency, please share this podcast with them. I'm your host, Kenny Hill, and I run a private practice near Sacramento, California called Recovery Hill. My website is in the description tab along with my social media links. The intro music was Two in the Back, performed by Sunday at Slams on Blue Dot Sessions.